Thank you a lot for the introduction and thank you a lot uh, for having me here. It was an honor when I got this invitation. I was very excited and I'm still very excited. And I was very impressed about the presentations yesterday. So I decided to change a little bit this title. So we will go quantum instead of just <laughs> staying in symmetries. Uh, we will look at quantum symmetries. We will look a little bit at fusion and braids in categories. That's kind of the idea. So we will change a little bit, but we will still see the other things, symmetries, groups, and braid as a warm up for the last part of the talk. Please feel free to interrupt me at any point in the talk if you have questions or comments or something needs clarification. So I wanted to start with kind of this uh, question of what is a symmetry or what is a symmetry. And if you look in Wikipedia, Wikipedia or or you ask people, usually I, I did this experiment asking my family and some other people, and usually words that appear when you ask, and actually I wanted to do this kind of cloud word with you, but takes some time to do it in the phone, so I skip it, but the kind of words that, that people tell you, it's beauty, balance, harmony, reflection, things like this, uh, proportion, and these this other words. So. Uh, and, and it's kind of what you find in Wikipedia, which is kind of this collective knowledge that we can look at. So where do we find these symmetries? And you can find it many places. For example, in nature, uh, there are many beautiful pictures online. If you, if you look at uh, the internet, you can also find it in the arts or, or this idea of balance, beauty that appears in, in these kind of things. And also in architecture is all over the place. And um, in many other things, in physics, in chemistry, in, in many other places, you can look and find symmetries. So how can we make this notion of symmetry more precise? And we're in this math conference, so we want to use math for that. Uh, and the general idea is that it's a type of invariance. So a mathematical object uh, X, let's say, has a symmetry if it's a unchange if it's uh, fixed under uh, apply or after applying certain operations or maps of functions. So that's the idea. And basically, I, I wanted to give you this beautiful example of the triangle, but I decided to skip for time reasons. But if you look at the triangle, for example, and you want a, a equilateral triangle, and you want to think about of the symmetries, some things that you will think about are reflections. You can reflect over different uh, sides that bisect the different sides, right? And you can also think of rotations. And one nice thing that you can do is you can combine two of these. So you can do one and after the other, and you are still uh, getting a symmetry because you are still fixing your object. Some other thing that you could do is do nothing, and that still counts as a symmetry. And that's a transformation. You apply kind of this identity transformation, uh, and that's a, still a symmetry. And something interesting that you can do is that you can undo these symmetries. If you reflect in, uh, with respect to the same side uh, or bisection by the same side, for example, you uh, go back to this uh, identity transformation uh, when you do it twice. Or if you rotate to 140 degrees and then 120 degrees, you, you, do the, you undo the thing that you were doing, basically. So that is that you have an inverse for the symmetries. One symmetry will be the inverse of, or some, uh, some other uh, symmetry. And one important thing is that the order matters in which we do these transformations. So the idea is that we have a mathematical structure uh, lying around this notion of symmetry, and that uh, mathematical structure is the structure of a group. What I'm saying is that the collection of all these uh, symmetries of my object X form a group. Uh, but there is a little bit more. First, I, I, I was talking about the symmetries of the equilateral triangle, and the idea is that you have all these six transformations that I was mentioning that are the symmetric group in three letters, and also the dihedral group in three letters. But if you want to look at the square, now it's just the dihedral group in four letters, not the uh, symmetric group in four letters. And this comes from thinking a little bit more about these symmetries. So what we are doing when we have this symmetry, basically, is uh, we have this group structure that I was saying, and we have our object x. And when I apply this symmetry, let's say this function f that I'm applying, I still get something in x. I, I get 
remember that this X is fixed under the F, basically, that's the idea. So what we get is more than just a group, is that our group is acting on, on our object. And this action is nice. It's a faithful action in this case. And uh, so when I was saying that this uh, sim X is a group, it's a group acting faithful on, on X and actually is the maximal faithful group acting on X. So that's nice. And that's why, for example, S4 doesn't act on this uh, square, but D4 does, and that's a maximal. Set for also, but set for is smaller faithful action than, than D4. That's why, uh, so I didn't write the complete notion, but the, the, the idea is that we will keep, or we will keep in mind is that symmetries and groups are kind of the thing or, or the same in some way, or, or the way to encode classical symmetries is using the notion of a group. And if I'm going too fast, also feel free to stop me or ask or interrupt. I will just say the definition of a group <laughs> uh, because I feel like it was bad not including it, but for, for so a group is this, a set of elements that has this binary operation that we will call a product and is associative. So I can move the parentheses when I have three things that I'm multiplying, has a unit and each element has an inverse for the product. So uh, for this product that we have. And some examples are the integers uh, with addition, the symmetric group that we were saying, the symmetries of of an object as we were looking, because we have the composition that will be our product, the identity map that it's the identity of the group, and then the inverse of the maps, these invertible maps that are the inverses in the group. And then if, for example, if you have a vector space, you can also look at the group structure if you look at addition and you forget about scalar multiplication, for example. So these are some of the things. And now, I want to focus not on the symmetric group, but on some generalizations of the symmetric group, but having the idea of the symmetric group in mind will be important. The symmetric group are all these invertible functions from n letters to n letters. And another way to describe it is using some generators and relation. We know that we can write any word in the symmetric group using these uh, transpositions i plus one. So now I want to add some relations. So I want to go to a group that is very nice and appear in the title of the, or the original title, I think in both titles, <laughs> that are braids. So when I think of braid, I think of all these things here, braids in the hair, braids in knitting. These are nano, nanotubes, carbon nanotubes. So these are very small. And I was very excited when I found this. <laughs> I don't know how people did this, but it's amazing. Uh, but we have also a break mathematically. And the way that for me, <laughs> it was easier to transition from, a, or to get this idea of break was thinking on generalizing or not, I don't know if generalizing, but thinking on the symmetric group and changing it a little bit. So this presentation by generators and relations of the break group is very similar to the one of the symmetric group. So we have that it's generated by certain things here, n minus one things, when I think on the braid group on n strands. As the, for example, in the symmetric group, we also have this n minus one transposition that generate the symmetric group that actually satisfy these two same relations. One is called far commutation. So if the indices on your, uh, on your generators are far away, uh, enough far away, it's not one next to the other, then they commute. But when they are next to each other, they, they satisfy something called the braid equation, actually. That's the braid equation. And the big difference between Bn and Sn is that I'm here. If I would like to write Sn, I'm missing one uh, of the relation, that it's this, each of these generators, when you square them, you get the identity. And that is very, so it's the only change that I'm doing, but it's a very big change. For example, you know how many elements you have in the symmetric group uh, and factorial, but here the braid group in n letters is in an, an infinite group. So it's a big change. And I present it in this way, which might be not the most uh, intuitive way, especially given the name, because I felt like it's easy to think about it from the symmetric group. It has a relation with the symmetric group in this way. Uh, so 
where are the breaks? There are many definitions of this uh, beautiful group, of this uh, braid group. And uh, one of the definitions is using braids, basically. So what we will do is we will think that we have n points on the top. So I have, you can think that you're in, in the table and you have actually strings, but you have n points. on the tops and on the bottom. And I guess I want to uh, put, I, I want to join this, this, uh, this dot, top and bottom. And there are some rules. Some things can happen and some things cannot. That is, you will just match. Uh, I could do more fun things if I would like to. Here we are in, in certain P6. Um, but so I could do this. I, I, I need to say if the string is going on top of or bottom, that's important. And that's the difference with the symmetric group. In the symmetric group, I don't care. I could write directly the strings because it's the same since, since the sigma i squares are the identity, it's the same crossing on top or on bottom. But here the, the crossing really matters. But things that I could not do, which are not great, let's say that I take, for example, I cannot do things like this, or when I cross this with this, I cannot twist the, the string in a loop. I need to do it in this way. And as, as it says there, are equivalent uh, classes of these braids. And what it's important, what it's this equivalent class is this uh, ambient isotopy. And, to think about it, if I could have this thing that it's all strands, uh, straight strands, and this mm -hmm. if you look at this. This is going first over the top, and then it's going again over the top of the other one. I could move this one. I could lift it and put it here. And again, I get these three straight lines. So these two things are equal for me or for us in this braid group. So that's kind of the things. And so maybe, sorry, maybe let me say, this is the way to go from the other definition to this one. This will be the sigma i's, and it's... Uh, just uh, all the str strands are straight, only the i and i plus one are, uh, are switching places, one over the other. And this is really a group. So the multiplication is on the bottom, even if it should be on the opposite side. But what we are doing is we're stacking one braid up to the other. We have the same number of strands uh, of dots, so we can stack them. And we think that they are only now one string, right? And again, usually you do this isotopy to get a nice picture, but this is the, the, new, the new braid. And if you check, this will give you the identity when you compose with the other one that I had in the previous page, which is basically what I was doing here with sigma one and sigma one inverse. And it's this idea that I can move it. This is the identity of the group, the N straight uh, lines. So, so how can we understand group theory uh, better? That was one example, and one nice example that will come back later in the talk. And I will mention more about the braid group, but I wanted to introduce this other notion and leave some questions about this, this idea. So how can we understand groups better? One idea is to use things that we know much more, that it's, for example, linear algebra. We have studied a lot linear algebra. There are a lot of interesting things that you can do. So the idea is that we want to put the information that we have about our group into matrices, for example, or into vector spaces more generally. So these are, I call them just representation. These are linear representations or linear actions that we will have. That's why I changed from actions to representation. For me, it's here we are really having linear and I didn't write this anywhere. So there is a field K, I mean, it's there, the field. And for me, this field always be algebraically closed. 
uh, and could have different characteristics, most of the talk will be characteristic zero. So you could be thinking of the complex numbers if you like for what I'm saying today. But a lot of these things can be generalized and some things broke a lot if you change, for example, to non-algebraically closed things. So I will stay in the safe land. Uh, so a representation uh, can be defined in many ways. I wanted to write it in a way that it's very clear the linear algebra or these matrices thing that we'll have, uh, we will have is we will have a group homomorphism from our group G to, uh, and in this case, N by N matrices over our field. That's why this is an N-dimensional representation. Again, you could define this using just vector spaces. I don't need finite dimension. Uh, it will be just invertible uh, or yeah, linear transformations. And this will end up being invertible because here we have a group. So a group homomorphism, just to refresh, is a map that preserves the nice structure that we have in our group. So it behaves well with the product, okay? So if I have f of x times y is f of x times f of y in the different products. So let's look a little bit at what this means if I look at a specific example, the one that we were looking, the, the braid group in three letters. For the braid group in, in three letters, we have just two uh, generators, sigma one and sigma two. So I'm switching uh, or yeah, uh, strand one and two and then two and three. And in this case, there is only uh, one relation because I don't have far commutation because my two generators are close enough. So I only have the braid relation. So if I would like to define a representation in this case, and in general, when I'm working with groups, uh, sorry, with groups generated by, or given by a presentation by generators and relations, what we can do is we can find the map by sending the generators to certain matrices, but we need to be sure because this is a group homomorphism that the relations are preserved. And that's what I wrote here. So what I want to do uh, is to find actually just two matrices, A and B, one for each of these things, these generators here, that satisfy my braid relation so that they have this thing. And this is, you can think about this for any uh, braid group in more letters. And also you can change here, these are n-dimensional representations when I look at n by n matrices. And there are a lot of study about the braid group representations. They play an important role in many uh, areas, these braid group representations. And I will later talk about the one that it's closer to my research area, which is uh, related with these braided categories that I was saying. But people have been studying these braid representations and they have some interesting features. Uh, here I was writing the finite dimensionals one and I wanted to tell you one result that it's known and maybe the theorem has a lot of words so the example is easier to see but two Van Benzel were studying uh, representations of this braid group um, in, uh, in, in N letters sorry maybe I'm using the word N twice maybe it's okay no uh, sorry it's uh, N dimensional representations of B3 and what they did or what they were able to do is classify them up to n equal to five. So they classify for up to five to five matrices. And then the things change. They, they show that things change, uh, but they don't have a nice description when it's bigger than five. So you will be thinking of this A and B that are five by five matrices. And what they prove is that if you have an irreducible representation, irreducible is especially nice a representation that you can use to construct the other representations. Uh, the, you, can, you can represent this, or you can use some special matrices, A and B, that has a very nice form. They are triangular matrices. So similar to the ones in the example, A could be always upper triangular. And actually I, I wrote here this asterisk, but they have a very precise description in terms of the information that they have. I, I just wrote that because I think. And what they do is they, they know that the diagonal will have the eigen values. And what is interesting is that here we write n because this happens for all the n's and here's zero. When you write b, b will be lower triangular. And now the eigenvalues will go in the opposite order. And, and these gave them representations. And these are very nice uh, 
shape for the matrices. So that's one of the results. So some questions that we have been studying or that people have been looking at is, can you, or and they are open, it's like, are there similar results than to Van Benzel for larger uh, groups, uh, BK? So with more letters, not just B3. Uh, we know that for uh, six dimensional representation, things change in, this, uh, in these examples, but yeah. What, what happened if instead of looking at B3, I look at BK? It might get much more complicated. One nice observation is that if you give me a V3 representation, sigma one, sigma two, so I will have this A and B, I can always immediately give you back a V4 representation. And this is very special from four, just because how the relations in that group are. But in that case, this AVA corresponding to sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three will give rise to a representation of V4. And one question is, what properties, and here I'm, I'm cheating a little bit because I didn't say what these uh, words are, but when you look at representation, you can have nice properties. For example, irreducible was one of the properties, indecomposable is other, unitary is other. It's, this depends a little bit on how these matrices look. For example, unitary is just that these matrices A, B will be unitary and things like this. So what if, if I start with AB having certain of these properties, what happens when I go to ABA? Or uh, that, that's kind of an uh, interesting question. And there are some work. We know how AB look for N up to five, and we don't know this answer even for that. And there is work from some people that has studied the, I, I was saying this classification is for irreducible, but some people has also studied in the composable representations of that, of V3, and they have some results. So that could be also used to see what happened here. The idea would be how can I get more irreducible representations or in the composable representations of V4, for example. So, so that are some of the questions. And here the, the, thing, the, the dolphins are here to remind me to say something else, and this is about three-dimensional generalizations. Why three-dimensional generalizations? I didn't say this, but the braid group, I give you two different definitions of the braid group, one by generators and relations, the other looking at the braids. There is another idea that it's that the braid group could be understood as a motion group of certain things. And that is that if you have endpoints in the plane and you want to see how they evolve in time, how are the motions of these endpoints, and actually this is important for what I will say later, this is also described or governed this uh, motion of these n dots or n particles, and that's what we will look later in the in the in the plane. These are governed by uh, by the braid group, so or in, in in the space. And then we would like to know instead of having uh, the dot or the point like elements. What if now I look at different motion groups? In particular, if I look at disks and I want to know how they evolve, and that's why these are kind of disks evolving on time. The, 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 we could do something with smoke also that people do, but the dolphin is sweeter. Uh, and actually, there is another group associated to this called the loop braid group, and it's because you have relations from the braid group, some other relation, relations coming from loops, and then some mixed relations. And there is also work done on studying uh, kind of what we can do with these two Babensel representations that we know for B3, what they tell us for the loop rate group in three letters and things like this. But that's much more open. Uh, the rate group has been studied for a long time. So what we could do with the loop rate group and maybe with other motion groups. There are other motion groups like the necklace group and some others. And, that it's also an interesting direction. And all these directions are not only motivated because it's interesting to know representations, but actually people in other areas of math and as, as, I, uh, as they told you, I, I do algebra and topology, but quantum algebra and quantum topology, but also in other areas of math, people care about this. And even in physics, physicists are, were very excited about understanding these uh, braid group representations are important for them. And the loop braid group also kind of arise or the interest arise from physics to trying to see this three-dimensional uh, idea. So maybe now let's go quantum for the other kind of part of or half of the talk or a little bit less. But 
I just wrote this there. But the idea is that now we would like to go to the quantum world. So now we will see things that are much smaller and the laws that govern classical objects don't apply anymore. So when you want to look at uh, quantum symmetries, the, the images change. And we also need to adapt uh, the idea. So what we want to do is we want to look at symmetries of quantum objects. So it's kind of the same idea. And basically these quantum symmetries describe features of space time and particle uh, which are unchanged uh, by certain transformations or maps, right? In the context of quantum mechanics. So the quantum mechanics principles are, uh, are there when, when you think about this. Uh, and that changed a lot. And that means that now when you look at quantum objects, sometimes a group is not enough. It's not longer enough to describe the symmetries of these quantum objects. So we need a different notion. Just before going to the notions, um, let me say that uh, this notion of quantum symmetry, uh, it's what I study and or, or kind of the algebraic object that model this is the notion, the, the thing that I study the most. Uh, and for me, it was very exciting to study this because it gave me the opportunity to learn from a lot of different areas of math. Quantum symmetries appear in different areas like mathematical physics. There are things called, for example, conformal field theories, um, vertex operator algebras, and quantum symmetries are there. The, from analysis, for example, which I was very surprised and shocked that I was going to be excited about that, but I am. Uh, of course, because von Neumann is kind of the thing for quantum. So von Neumann algebra, sister algebra, subfactor theory, planar algebras also uh, in all these areas appear quantum symmetries. I started studying these topics because I, I loved algebra and I studied something called non-commutative algebra. So algebras where the product is non-commutative. And there is a very beautiful class of non-commutative algebras called Hof algebras. That's how I studied, uh, started. And these Hof algebras are kind of the right notion to look at when you want to study something called a quantum group. Some places you will, you will read that the correct notion of a quantum symmetry or the quantum symmetries are described in the same way that groups were the, the host or, or the way to encode classical symmetries. A lot of people think that quantum groups are the way to describe quantum symmetries, but here I will tell you a little bit, something a little bit more general than quantum groups. So this idea of quantum groups and Hopf algebra was how I started studying this. Uh, then again, the, the braid group and links and not appear here because low dimensional topology was kind of the way that these things arise, uh, th that we start, or not me, but that people starting studying this. In the 90s, there were revolutionary work by uh, Dreamfeld looking at these quantum groups, by Witten that was uh, studying uh, topological quantum field theories and some other people too, and then a uh, work by Von Jones uh, that was studying uh, the John polynomial links and not invariant. And then work of uh, Reshetik and Nanturev was very surprising because unified or, or made connections between all these things. And that notion is the one that I, or part of that notion is the one that I want to introduce today. And I want to claim that that's the right uh, definition of, or, the right analogy for quantum symmetry and symmetries and groups. So to do that, I want to introduce categories. I will not go super in detail in categories, but some people say that, uh, some people call it different ways. I think I can call it this way because I study category theory and it's not offensive, but some people, when you talk about category theory, they say that it's abstract nonsense, that why you study this. I really like it. I think it's a beautiful language and let you see different things. So different fields that you can study, you can see this from a different abstract point of view and you can prove theorems or uh, fascinating things that you can prove it along different areas using category theory, for example. Um, for me, it's very beautiful. A category is not that complicated to see when you look at this. The idea behind this, so just the definition is that we will have a collection of objects and, R, and the other thing that we have is arrows between objects. And this is very natural because sometimes you want to study some 
mathematical objects and you define that object, that the structure that you are interested in. And the second thing that you do is how are the maps that preserve this structure, right? So that's the idea that we are capturing here, right? We have the objects and then we have the maps, the arrows between these objects that will preserve the structure that we are looking at in principle. And we have a composition. This composition needs to be associative. And for each object that you have, when you look at maps between the object and itself, you always have the identity. That it's a category I didn't write all the details. Some here I, I kind of cheated because all the categories that I wrote here have sets underlying, but there are other categories that look more exciting. There are other categories that are very crazy, and I will always look at categories that are small in certain sense. But for example, the category of sets with functions, the category of topological spaces with continuous maps, the, con the category of groups with group homomorphisms, the category of abelian groups, and now I stay and I still say with group homomorphisms because being abelian is just a property. I don't change anything on the maps that I'm looking at. So these are some examples and you can, okay, I lost this. You can do many other examples. I will do one in a second. But the idea, I, I want to mention two ideas here when I say category. One idea is that objects are not, that that important i don't want to use elements when that's the big difference i i will be looking at sets and topological spaces and group and this so i do have elements in these specific examples but in some other examples of categories i don't have really the elements so when i think of the arrows it's slightly different the way that we want to think um so for example when you have an arrow i don't know a group homomorphism it's something that you do is you define the kernel or the kernel of that, right? All the points that go to, to the identity. When you do category theory, you want to define that, but you don't want to say all the elements that have this property. You have something called universal properties and that's the way that you do. So instead of describing things using the elements in your object, you will use the maps or the arrows or the transformations between your objects to say something. Uh, so it's a different philosophy in some way. And the other thing is that uh, for us, when we study category theory, equality is kind of too much to ask. So a lot of the times we will not ask for equality. We will ask for something called isomorphism. So for invertible maps between two things. Uh, so like when you're studying groups, I don't really care exactly what is the presentation of the group. I just care, okay, these two groups are isomorphic. For me, it's the same. I, I don't care really which is the presentation or, or the specific way that you are describing the group. So I will look at this specific example because it's one uh, that gives you the intuition of all the nice properties that I do want to have in the special objects that we will define in a second. So we will look at the category of finite dimensional vector spaces. Here I'm cheating, I didn't write, but it's over field K again, algebraically close. Better we can go with characteristic zero, but algebraically close for sure. So what are the nice features that I have? If you give me two vector spaces, you, I can always give you back a new one using the direct sum, okay? Uh, I, I don't know if people is familiar, but so we will have a new basis given by the, the basis of the other, right? Uh, Okay, so it will be the union of things that are bases here and here. So I have a new vector space that has M plus M dimension. If B has dimension N and this has and W has dimension M, and you have the zero dimensional vector space. I make it a point here because it's important. It's kind of important for the direct sum is the neutral element for this direct sum. There is much more here that I'm not saying, but this has this nice structure of of the direct sum, right? Again, it's kind of a linear structure that we are looking at that level, an abelian linear structure. This here, I'm saying that the linear transformations, if I look at these two objects, I need to look at the arrows between this object, the vector spaces. The arrows are linear transformations in this category, right? These are the, the maps that behave well with the linear structure. So this, in this case, this forms again, a finite dimensional vector space. And this is actually a coincidence that it's again the same thing, but it's important that our vector spaces, the, the arrows form vector spaces again. I have this nice one dimensional vector space. And one thing that it's very nice about the one dimensional vector space is that if you look, it doesn't have any subspace other than itself and the zero subspace, right? Just because of dimension. So I will call it simple. 
basically is that, that when I look at my object, I don't have any other sub-object other than this zero that appears here and the object itself. That are simple. And then one nice thing is that any vector space, I could write it as using direct sums of these, of, of copies of, of, of K, right? Any vector space is isomorphic to n, time, n, n copies of, of the field if uh, the vector space has dimension uh, n. Other very nice thing that we can do is we can have a product there. We have this tensor product. So now I have this new vector space that has dimension n times m. So here is the product of the dimension. Here was the sum of the dimensions. And the vector space, the one dimensional vector space is a unit for this product. I have dual vector spaces. If you have the, the vector space, you can take the linear maps between V and the field, and that's the dual. But it's not just that. I have this nice evaluation and co-evaluation maps. Evaluation is just plugging in. Co-evaluation is a little bit more tricky, and that's why here I ask for finite dimensional. All the things that I did before, oh no, maybe did not, but most of the things I did before, you could do it in general, but this one, not. And the map that I'm writing here, or the co-evaluation that I'm thinking here is I will send the one to just the sum of a basis tensor, the dual basis. And here I have a finite sum, so I'm fine. But actually, it's more than that. These two maps need to satisfy something called zigzag axioms. That is, when you compose them in a certain way, you get the identity. And if you assume that the evaluation is the evaluation that you want, it's just plugging in something, uh, the coevaluation only exists when it's finite dimensional. So this restriction is giving you some finiteness there. And then we have the flip. If you flip the, the two sides, just switching the sides, uh, that's a linear transformation there. So these are the nice properties that I have in a braided fusion category. So a braided fusion category, and again, these categories have a lot of a structure that are these names here, but basically I'm copying, I'm mimicking the same things that I said for vector spaces. I want to have an abelian K linear category. Abelian is just that I have a direct sum. I have home spaces that are vector spaces. That's why I say that I was cheating a little bit. It was a coincidence that I was in vector space and vector space, but here, I really want that the home spaces are not just sets. I want them to be K vector spaces. And there are some other things that matter here. Again, this, in the same way as in, in the vector spaces, but we will leave it on there. I want this to be semi-simple, meaning that any object, in the same way that any vector space was copies of the field, here I want that any object can be written as copies of the symbols. Simples being this object that don't have any non-interest or non-trivial sub-objects, zero or itself. This, it's very nice because combining with the other structure, with the monoidal structure that it's having this tensor product, having a unit object, and here in a minute I will tell you what are A, L, and R. These two things mm, together give you something called fusion rules. So what are the fusion rules? If you give me two objects here, you give me Let's say I will take xi tensor xj, and these two are simples. This doesn't need to be simple, but let's keep it in simple. So these two together give me a new object in my category. But my category is semi-simple. So now this object decomposes again as a sum of symbols. So I will write it as, and uh, here we get xj, here they are symbols. And here I could even look at isomorphic and classes of symbols because I told you I don't care about the symbol itself, I, I care only about isomorphism. So here we have how many times I have this object or this isomorphism class here. So this is the number of times. So this is a natural number or zero. So that's nice. That are called the fusion rules and it's important. So, oh, sorry. So, then I will have uh, this associative A here, it's called the associativity. I told you, I cannot ask for equality. So changing the parentheses on the tensor product cannot be an equality. It will be a map, a natural isomorphism. And it needs to satisfy certain nice axioms. The same for L and R that are telling us that this is unital. Uh, this is called the pentagon axiom. If you have four objects, there are five ways to put parentheses. That will be the 
um, vertices of a pentagon. And then the arrows will be the ways to put associativities there. And I will say that actually all the ways are coherent and give me a path from one to the other using that diagram. I will not write it, but that's what we do a lot in category theory. We will write diagrams. So I have rigidity. I want to have duals with evaluation and co-evaluation, satisfying that zigzag equation that I mentioned. Something important is that I want only finitely many simples. The number of simples up to isomorphisms always, finitely many simples up to isomorphism, is called the rank. I want that the unit is always simple, like in vector spaces that was a field. And if I add this other last part, that it's a natural isomorphism from making my tensor probe commutative, that's called a braid, and my category is uh, braided. So this last correspond to this thing. And actually, it's not just this commutativity at the level of the product. You also need a, another axiom that it's called hexagon axiom. We have two of them. And that hexagon axiom translates to the exact uh, braid equation that I was mentioning when I defined the braid group. That's one of the connections with braided uh, or with the braid group. So I will not go in detail over this, but the collection of all the linear representations of a group form one of these nice fusion categories and actually it's braided. I didn't explain, or, or here it's explained how each of the things happen. It doesn't uh, matter and we can talk more if you're interested, but the important idea is that, again, we, we have this idea of classical symmetry that was encoded by my group and now I recover it here in this, in this world of braided fusion categories again. Uh, the, the notion of the group. And actually these fusion categories generalize this. So just to say why it's this idea of quantum is that if you know physics and if not, you can skip this. I will talk just one minute. It's this idea that uh, we have some particles and we want to see how they, be they behave. We have this anionic system with the anions. So my simple objects will be describing the anion types that I have in my system. Each of these things that I described, the tensor product, the unit, all of them have one or have some analog in the physics world. The, the tensor product was giving me the fusion. It's the way that I can fuse two of my anions. The unit, it's giving me something called the ground state or the vacuum type. It has different names. The, the duals are the antiparticles. Always, if you have a particle, you need to have an antiparticle. And that's also visualizing the symmetry in the quantum symmetries appear very strongly that if you have a, a thing, you need to have the anti of that one also there. And okay, we have other things like annihilation creation and these things. The braiding is something interesting because it's the par ex uh, describing the particle exchange, how the particles evolve on time, as I was mentioning the other way to define the braid group, so it appears naturally. And this other doesn't matter, we will skip it. And it has very interesting applications. Physicists are super excited about studying these fusion braided, even more called modular categories, which have some non-degeneracy on them. That was this last part. And I will not say much, but the idea is that uh, in physics, what we are doing is we are creating, we start from the vacuum, so from this unit object. And what we do is we use the dual to create particles and antiparticles. So always will appear in these pairs. And then we want to do some operations, some transformation. So what we will do is we will do a braid. We will see how this evolves on time. That's the same as applying gates when you are doing computing, when you are computing in the computer science side, right? And then what you want to know is you want to get to the vacuum again. So you, in this case, you will uh, measure. And we want to know the probability of getting again the vacuum type at the end. And that's kind of the parallel with computing. And this is kind of uh, the idea be behind uh, topological quantum computing, using these uh, braids and these tensor categories for them. So maybe just uh, I will mention quickly uh, a couple of things. From braided ca categories, it's very natural to get, or, or it's a way to get braid group representations. Every uh, braided fusion category give rise to some nice, uh, braid group representation just because this sigma i could be sent. Remember that if it's braided, we have this nice map that makes my tensor probe commutative. What I will do is I will write a lot of copies of x and I want to make maps from n copies of x to n copies of x. That will give rise to 
uh, rep and n dimensional, uh, sorry, a representation of, of, of Vn. How? What I do is I just say that uh, doing this uh, swap between the strand i and i plus one is the same as braiding with the braid that we have in the tensor category, the copy i and i plus one of my x. That's what I'm doing. And that gives rise to examples. This is very important because physicists care a lot about something called the Young-Baxter equation or quantum Young-Baxter equation. And this is a way to get solutions. A lot of this uh, motivated also the work of Dringfeld when we, he was studying quantum groups. And, and he found a way to find solutions to that Young-Baxter equation. So that's uh, uh, this is the relation between the braid group and the braid very diffusion categories. At least I wanted to mention why the name. Some problems that we studied in this area. First of all, these are algebraic models for these bosonic topological phases of matter. Some other things that we studied is what if we change bosonic for fermionic? If this doesn't make sense, doesn't matter. But our names that appear in physics, how we can model. The model for these for this bosonic topological phases of matter are called modular category. So it's this braid diffusion categories plus one extra condition. The other is, okay, physicists always want to have, or in general, people want to classify, to have like periodic tables of things that you know. So that's what we try to create. Like if you think of groups, you have this idea of the order of the group. Uh, people was trying to classify all finite groups or groups by order or things like this. We do the same in this field, but this is a much younger field. So in one slide, I will tell you how far are we from getting there? But that's the idea. We want to have a periodic table. I want to tell you what are the important things that you need to look in your category that will describe them. And also, if you give me some of these invariants, like the rank, the number of symbols, can I give you all the possible categories that have that rank? That are some of the questions that we study. Uh, and then we want to have some, there are some questions that come from quantum information that we want to interpret in this setting. and. For example, universality of the, of the computations and things like this. And we have some answers for that. Uh, and the idea is to relate it with some uh, notion of dimension that I skip it, but it's very beautiful and comes from the frobenius perron theorem using that matrix or that coefficients N, I, J, K that are natural numbers. But we will skip because I'm almost on time. So let me tell you very fast some of the results. So there is a very strong classification program a lot of people, I only named some, but a lot of people working on this. So one of the things that we try to do is classify by rank, which is the number of simple objects that you have up to isomorphism in your category. If I only ask fusion, we only know when it's rank three. Imagine that that's quite sad because if you have rank one, it's BEC, the category of finite dimensional vector spaces. I'm only adding two other symbols and that's it what I can say. Actually, I'm I'm cheating because I do have an extra condition there. But for rank four, it's something known. If you ask modular, which is this non-degeneracy thing, we can go up to rank six, which is not that much either. And if you want to add some things like this dimension that I was saying that we can get from Frobenius Perron is odd, for example. We have some work with uh, Austina Schenke. She did it was, uh, with me when she was an undergraduate, actually. And now she's doing PhD in Oregon. And we can go up to rank 15, and now we think we can go up to rank 23. So that gives you a lot more space. Then other thing that we do is we classify by dimension. We fix the dimension and we give you the list. Uh, for this, we only know for certain uh, factorizations of the dimension, depending on the primes. Uh, and things get much uglier when you have a two, or much fun, I don't know. Uh, the two always make things uh, slightly different. And one other exciting area that we are looking at, one problem that we have is that most of the examples that we know come from quantum groups. We are in the search of exotic examples. One way to try to look for exotic examples is, okay, let's try to classify. Is anything new there or not? That's one way. The other is try to find constructions of these categories. You give me one, I give you a new one, right? Like when you do groups, you have the direct product of groups or things like this. So that's what we work. The Dreamfeld Center is a very classical construction. You give me a monoidal category, I give you back a braided monoidal category. We have that. And with some collaborators, we export it from physics, this idea of gauging a symmetry, and we wrote it in terms of something called higher category theory. So it's category theory, but going to higher levels, <laughs> or more, you have more arrows, basically, one arrow, two arrows, and things like this. And then we have this testing, which what we do is we 
use some cohomology data to change a little bit the flavor of our categories and get a new one. Um, but there are many other interesting directions and this is a very young field, so uh, I think it's very exciting. Thank you for your attention.